I'm Kit Hale, broker for MKB Realtors and a longtime member of the Roanoke Valley Association of Realtors Standard Forms Committee. And I'm going to go over some changes that will, of the purchase agreement that will be hitting the zip form and Skyslope libraries by July 1st. And the reason I say by July 1st, July 1st is a Saturday, so we're going to have these documents in those libraries on June 30th. And the reason July 1st is a significant uh, deadline, if you will, for these documents to be in these libraries is a change to the statute in the General Assembly made back in this most recent session that will be taking effect July 1st. And that change was urged by the Virginia Association of Realtors for very valid reasons. And the change has to do with the common interest communities, otherwise known as a property owners association or a condominium association and their respective statutes and respective acts. So while it was important to keep those two statutes separate, the rights and obligations of the purchaser and the seller are very similar. So what the General Assembly did was bring those rights and obligations into alignment having to do with common interest community disclosures. And you'll see here while we used to call the, or beginning July 1st, we'll call the document package a resale certificate. Remember that the Property Owners Association, uh, we always refer to that as the packet, and for a condominium we call it the resale certificate. They will all be called resale certificates now. So you'll see and you'll get information from the MLS as to which of these boxes to check. So if you'll see in the MLS, if the property is in a property owners association or in a condominium association, you'll be able to get that information from the MLS and you'll check obviously one of these two boxes. So let's assume that it is in a common interest community. A CIC is the way it's referred to acronym CIC. And this is the seller's representation that the ownership of the property within the CIC is one of these two, either subject to the Property Owners Association Act or subject to the Condominium Act. And then we're gonna talk here in just a minute about these exemptions. But assuming that, the, that you get that information from the MLS, you will check one of these two boxes here. Now, if in fact it's, it's exempt, well, how do you know it's exempt? Good question. So we're gonna go over here to the statute and look quickly at the exemptions, and you can see uh, what they are here. We're gonna prepare a white paper or a document and post that somewhere and make sure y'all know where it is. But very quickly, you'll see that these exemptions include uh, the initial uh, disposition of the uh, property by the declarant. You'll see that if the uh, exempted, if it's a gift, for example, or if a court directs the uh, disposition of the unit, or if it's a foreclosure and uh, in, in the seller uh, was, was uh, foreclosed, it's, it's, it would be exempted auction. And the, the key here is that the resale certificate, as we're going to come to call it, was made available as a part of the auction package to prospective purchasers prior to the auction. And then you can see in this last one here, it's the disposition of a unit in the common interest community, a CIC, containing no residential units, such as a, a commercial type of a condominium uh, property. Okay, so I'm going to flip back over here to the purchase agreement and talk about how this paragraph has been mashed together, uh, combining both the Property Owners Association dis disclosure and the condominium disclosure. So this piece here hasn't changed a lot, and I'll get into what has changed here in just a second. But if you look here, this is the new code section that refers to the Resale Disclosure Act. And in the Resale Disclosure Act, it continues to allow for the purchaser to cancel within three days or up to seven days if extended by the ratified real estate contract, which is gonna be more in this paragraph right here. 
So we're going to get to that in just a second. But you can see by the language in this paragraph has to do with the purchaser's cancellation rights. Now, what we've learned is there are, were a couple of provisions, both in the Property Owners Association statute and the condominium statute, that quite frankly was an oversight when the new 2310 was um, discussed and passed by the General Assembly. So I'm gonna jump over here right quick and show you what I'm talking about. And it'll make sense once I get back to the purchase agreement. The Property Owners Association Act has currently, but will not have once the statute takes effect on July 1st, rights of waiver and rights of variation. So here's what that means. Currently, and up to July 1st, the rights and obligations under the POA statute here cannot be uh, varied by agreement and the rights may not be waived. It also refers to 1809, which is that laundry list of items that must be included in what is now being called the uh, packet, what will be called the resale certificate after July 1st. So this has to do with the POA Act. Similarly, the Condominium Act, variation by agreement, uh, code section 1902, mirrors the, the language in the POA Act, which talks about that the uh, Act cannot be varied by agreement and the uh, rights conferred by this chapter may not be waived. So it was an oversight by admission, and it might be a decent oversight that these rights of waiver and these rights to, that you cannot uh, vary or waive did not make the uh, new statute. And so here's how that works. Here's how that will work now. The seller will always have to provide the resale certificate. It's in a different part of the statute, and the language in that part of the statute uses seller shall. So the seller shall uh, provide the resale certificate. Right here is where the waiver, if you will, and the variation between these days here can be negotiated. And so if, for example, this was a zero right here, that would imply and certainly mean that if that was accepted by all parties, that the written notice of cancellation shall be delivered within zero days. In other words, this is a way that the purchaser can waive their rights to cancel the contract under this statute. Now, the, uh, similarly, the purchaser could try to negotiate, say, for example, a 10 number of days, which varies between the three and seven, this three and seven up here also. And so this notion of variation by agreement is negotiable just like days are in our inspection process or loan application or any other days that are in our purchase agreement, that this now becomes a negotiated field why anyone would need 10 days to review a, a resale certificate is unknown, and why a purchaser might waive their rights under this provision here by putting a zero in may very well uh, re, uh, imply that the purchaser may be competing with another offer and doesn't care about what's in the packet, the, but they still have the right to receive the packet. So know that this was an oversight by the General Assembly and that the, uh, that the number of days can be varied and the purchaser can waive their rights to cancel, not any other rights that they may have under the POA statute or the condominium statute, but the purchaser could waive their rights to cancel the contract uh, as a part of a, ne a negotiation tactic. Also of note is this provision here where it talks about that the, if the resale certificate was issued more than 30 days, uh, but less than 12 months before settlement, the purchaser or seller upon providing proof that the purchaser, uh, the contract that the purchaser is the 
contract purchaser may request an updated resale certificate. And it must be paid for by the person ordering this certificate. And of, of great note, please, this the resa updated resale certificate does not extend the cancellation periods that we talked about up here. And then lastly, when this is currently in the, in the uh, statute that the purchaser's right to receive the resale certificate and the right to cancel the contract are waived if they are not exercised before settlement. So even if the purchaser had a zero up here, if they never received the packet, they would have the right to terminate or cancel the contract if they don't receive the packet uh, before settlement. Okay, so that's the, the, uh, the CIC disclosure paragraph. So you'll see here in paragraph number six that we've moved the lead-based paint disclosure from where it used to be. I think it was paragraph number 18, if I'm not mistaken. And we moved it up here to paragraph six. Why, you ask? Good question. And the reason is because we mashed up paragraph five, which was formerly the Property Owners Association paragraph, and paragraph six was the Condominium Act. We mashed them together into a new paragraph five here called this Common Interest Community Disclosure. But by doing that, if we just went on with the document, we would have had to rename or renumber the entire rest of the document. And I don't know about y'all, but I have been coming green with this paragraph 14's inspections and 15's I-9, 16 is pre-settlement verification, and 17 is so on and so forth. So rather than renumber all those, we reached deeper into the purchase agreement and drug lead-based paint up here to paragraph six, because as we talked about, we got rid of both paragraph number five and paragraph number six of the purchase agreement. So we moved it up and uh, felt like that it was a, a disclosure. So when we were disclosing a CIC, we felt like it was appropriate to disclose lead-based paint as well. Other changes include, and they're fairly minor, we um, uh, added a, a couple of things here in the fixtures and personal property, paragraph number 10, we wanted to include smart home devices such as uh, can you know ring doorbells or as a brand or you know camera doorbells and various other things and and how they may be attached to the real property. Nothing else significantly changed in paragraph ten. As you can see, uh, we had to renumber because once we got beyond paragraph eighteen, where we heisted the lead-based paint paragraph. Everything after that had to be renumbered. So you can see we did that right here again. Very minor changes. We changed a few wills to, sh I'm sorry, a few shells to will. And you'll see that both in the revised exclusive right to represent seller agreement and then uh, the purchase agreement. And that was sort of a legal uh, guidance that we'd gotten from an attorney that that's more appropriate for the, the type of, of language. And uh, I think that's about it. Let me scroll through this very quickly. And this is where, by the way, as I told you, we heisted the lead-based paint from paragraph number 18. So then every paragraph after 18 had to be renumbered. And you'll see that as we go along here. Not anything earth-shattering. So that's it for the purchase agreement. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any member of the Standard Forms Committee. Laura Benjamin or myself and good luck. Thank you.